Am I too loud? All right. Hi, my name is Marcus Wallach. I'll be giving a presentation on wrapping Go in Python. So first, a little bit about me so I can introduce myself. I already said my name. My favorite fictional character is Batman. And currently, my favorite music quote is, even the boxing critics know that if I get off to a rocky start, I'll always have a rocky finish, Eminem. Um, a few things about this talk and presentation. It is currently all online at my GitHub. So if you go to that link or URL right there, you could follow along and run the program as I'm running it. Uh, I'll leave that up there for a second so you guys have time. Everybody good? All right. So a talk overview. What I'm going to be covering in this talk is how to build shared objects in Go, calling shared objects, object files from Python, and testing out what is possible in this realm. And then I'll have some ending remarks. So that's just a general overview of what we're going to be doing today. Section one, it can be done. We are going to write a Go program, make a shared object file out of it, make a shared object out of it, and then call that program in Python, just to see what can be done. Now I'm open my terminal. That's the wrong tab. Is this big enough for everybody? Should I make it bigger? All right. Section one. So I'm going to show you the two files that we have. It is Hello World Go and Hello World Python. So I'll show you the Python one first. It doesn't do much. So it imports C types. Now, C types is a module that allows you to interact with foreign functions, and in this case, C. We import OS so that we can find the path to the shared object file. We find the path. We load it. Uh, there are two different ways of loading shared object files. This is the method I prefer, ctypes.cdll, and then the path. And then we can call our, uh, we load it into the lib, and then we can call the method that we exported. Now I'm going to show you the Go file so you get a sense of what's going on. So the syntax for the Go file is pretty straightforward. Each Go file needs a, a package. This one we call main. We have our import statements. We're importing C and FMT. We don't really need FMT. Well, in this case, we do because we're printing out. But more importantly, for the shared object file, we have to explicitly state what we're going to export. So we use this syntax to tell our program that this method, this function, is going to be exported with this name. So if we go back real quick, we notice that in the Python file, when we're calling the function, we're calling it by the exported name. Now, I already went over a little bit of shared object files, but let me go more in depth on what they are. There are shared libraries, are libraries that are loaded by programs when they start. In terms of convention, these files are usually kept in a special place and given special names. You can read more about them at this link. Um, but for our purposes, we need to know that Go can build shared object files and that these files will end in .so. All we need to know for now. I already showed you the hello world file. Now, this is the build command. So the syntax is go build dot dash o, the name of the so file, what do you want to name it as, and build mode is c share, and then you have the source file, which is your go file. Um, one thing to note is that as of go 1.5, you're allowed to build shared object files. So any go version prior to that, this is not possible.
uh, go back to the terminal real quick so we can see that in action. Um, for convenience, I put all of these build commands into a bash script. So it has it right here. I'm just going to run this bash script real quick. Oh, I'm not using Go yet. Uh, I'm using Go 1.6.2. I use TBM to manage my Go versions. And let's try that again. This time we've got no error. All right, I'll let this finish. So what we're going to do after this command finishes, oh, it finishes. It's called Python and the hello world file. which then prints hello world. So now we know that we can create a shared object file in Go, and then dynamically call that file in Python. We didn't pass anything between the two, but we now know what is initially possible. So let's go over the possibilities. Section two. Um, I'm going to try to pass some ints, strings, floats, booleans, lists, dictionaries, and see what sticks. Let's start with ints first. Uh, so the structure for my layout is import, or int input is Python passing things to Go. Output is Go passing things to Python. Oh, my apologies. Uh, So I'm going to open the Python file just to show you what it looks like. All of the files have pretty much the same layout. Um, path, load the library. This one takes the user input. And then we're going to pass that user input to the shared method that we are calling from Go, or the SO file. And we're going to let that handle the rest. Now let me show you the Go file real quick. Here we have the signature where we're taking in an integer and then we're printing it out to the screen. I already built these files, so I'm just going to run them. Int input. Anybody have a favorite integer? 55. 55. Ta-da! We just passed 55 from Python to Go and then Go printed it out. So we know that we can pass into one direction. Let's try the other direction. So let me open the file just so you get a brief overview of what the file entails. Int output. Same general layout. This time I'm just calling uh, the shared object method function. And then I'm printing it out in Python. Hmm? Oh, misspelled Python. Another integer? I like that one. 42. So this time, we just took an integer from Go and then passed it to Python to print it out. So that means now we can pass integers both to and from Go and, Py Go and uh, Python. So we now know we can pass integers. Let's, let's look at strings. So the file layout is pretty much the same. Here I did a number of attempts and I left them here so people can see my trial and error. But for the brevity of the talk, we're just going to go to the one that works. String input, and it's usually, it's always the last round. So the reason why I opened this one is because I want to show you how we have C types. And we have to deal with those types explicitly at times. So the reason in the past example, we're using integers. But in terms of integers, 
they get converted almost by default. However, if we use something other than integers, we at times have to figure out the corresponding C type. And this one, it's C type C char P, which just converts it to bytes per se and then passes it. Uh, Python 3. And let me clear the screen so you guys can. Is that good? Input round three. Um, hi. We just passed a string from Python to Go. And the other one, I won't show you the file because it has pretty much the same layout through all of them, but it's passing a string from Go to Python. So when I notice when passing strings from Go to Python are two things. One, actually I should open the file so you can have explicit. Uh, that's the Python file. Output Sego. So the reason why that is called C Go is because in Go you also have to do some conversions from Go to C. And here we're passing a pointer to a C char. And to scroll down, you have to explicitly take a Go string and convert it to a C string before you can pass it in order for this to work. Um, another thing to notice is that when we ran the program, what Go returned to us was bytes. And then that has to explicitly be converted to a string if you want to use it properly. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over um, floats or booleans. But I can tell you that for a boolean, when you pass it back and forth, go passing a boolean to Python gets interpreted as a 0 or 1. In terms of floats, you can pass floats directly. However, you have to explicitly find the C type to correspond to what the go is passing to you. Now, all this is great and all, but if you are doing this, there's probably some reason you're doing this. You probably want to utilize some of Go's features in, in Python or the Go speed, concurrency, one of those. And you can do that. Oh, this is the wrong slide. So I have some contri contrived examples of that. One is a prime checker, and the other one is a prime counter. The difference between the two is that the prime counter uses Go's channels and Go routines to, and uh, thank you, I have one minute left, so I have to try to be quick. Prime counter uses Go's Go routines and channels in order to try to make the program run faster and a concurrent model. And prime checker is just a poor implementation of trying to check a prime. So I'll run both of them really quickly. They have the same, 
general principle and file layout as everything else. So prime checker, I just confirmed that I can check to see if it's a prime, seven. Run another number, let's do 100. Reasonably fast. One more. Okay, it's not a prime, but it went rather fast. And prime channel. Let's go with all the primes under 4,000, 550. The reason why that ran so fast is because I was able to use ghost concurrency. Given the time constraint, I can't open the file, but I can remind you that all the source code is on my GitHub repo. Um, that is all I have for today. How about this good? One more zero? I did that once in the past. That's where I got the idea from. You in the front? Oh, so the .h files, you do not have to define. When you run the build command, uh, go builds that for you, and it's just there. Um, I, right over there? I am not sure. I haven't run in, I've run into issues trying to get this to work, but after getting it to work, I haven't run into many issues. So I, I can't say for certain. Uh, one last question. From my understanding, it is only primitives. If you try to pass a list or a dictionary, the error you get is it cannot be converted because it doesn't know how to convert it. Um, but if you find a way of doing passing structs or objects, please let me know. Um, that is the end of my talk. Thank you for your time.